looks like it is about to go live on YouTube. One moment, and then we'll get started. Hope everyone's doing well. At least we're getting people filtering in. Um, as always, if you have any questions, do let me know. Uh, you know, I used to live in California, so I spent a lot of time in, in San Francisco, actually. Unfortunately, since the COVID thing, no one's been traveling, and I haven't been there in, in quite some time. But it is a beautiful city, for sure. All right, let's, uh, let me share my screen. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Sharon. Tom, Joseph, John. Uh, Shanti, nice to see you again. Okay, let me share my screen. And Sheila's uh, up in Washington State. I know Shanti's in, in Sacramento. Linda is in uh, Santa Clarita. Um, see, I'm remembering where everyone's from. Sandy, I'm not sure where you're from. Tell me, what, type in where you're calling from. Same with Tom, Joseph, John as well. All right, let me share my screen here. There we go. And let me minimize this before I scare you with the crazy diagram in the very beginning. Oh, let me close all this. And let me blow it up. All right, well, this is actually part two. Uh, I think around, I would say, the third or fourth week, uh, we went over toxins and... Um, as Sandy's in Stanford, nice. So um, we went through this, we went through part one, I would say, where we really essentially, some of the big takeaways from that are a few, let's go through them. One is that a lot of the risk of toxins, we all have a, a detoxification system. It's called the liver as well as, and you'll, you'll understand exactly how that happens. Um, and our livers are actually really remarkable at being able to get rid of toxins, actually. It just so happens though, that there are people in, the, in our community that are sort of like the canary in the coal mine. There are people who essentially can easily get pushed over to being sick from these toxins. And for most of us, uh, we're able to handle these toxins nonetheless it's important to understand how we're learning more and more about how these toxins may have more implications than we actually thought about. And in the first lecture, you know, way back 10, 12 weeks ago or so, we spoke about how diabetes, um, when you look at it as an association with obesity, the risk actually happens more when you, uh, when you take into account levels of toxins. In other words, when people were gaining weight, the the general opinion was, well, if you're gaining weight, you know, eventually you're going to, you know, you're going to get diabetes. And actually, you know, when you take out the association with toxins, the risk for diabetes is actually with obesity is not actually as high as you would nearly high as you would think. It's the contribution of obesity plus toxins that actually can result in things like diabetes and metabolic syndrome. And we're gonna discuss that a little bit more, but um, you know, when I was in medical school, you know, we, of course, in basic physiology, we learned about the detoxification, detoxification pathways in the liver. And you know, the word, quote, the word detox, you know, does have sort of a negative connotation out there. It's associated with alternative health practitioners, you know, various, trendy deep quote detoxes um, that and it's an unfortunate thing that that's happened only because there are very interesting medical studies that show that toxins do play a fairly significant role and what's happened actually is that because there have been so many kind of you know unusual quote detox programs and detox foods and detox this and detox that, what's happened actually in the medical community, unfortunately, is that the medical doctors like myself um, 
well, not exactly like myself because I see it as significant, but medical doctors in general, conventionally trained medical doctors, they hear the word detox and immediately they, they just turn it off because they, they think that it's some kind of alternative woo-woo kind of thing out there. Um, now, I, I've had an interest in toxins, not that I'm any expert at all at this. I can tell you that this, this is actually a very challenging um, thing to put together, only in the sense that you know, there's a lot of new science, and uh, but it's it's wonderful that uh, you know that I have this opportunity to to go through it the way the way we're going to do it tonight. Uh, and so, anyway, essentially, doctors hear the word detox and they just think it's total nonsense. Well, I'd like to convince you by the end of this lecture that it's it's not nonsense, and there's well established literature that really documents some of these these toxins. I'll give you an example that I might have mentioned in the first lecture, but you know, uh, my initial postgraduate, post uh, after I graduated medical school, I spent a year doing internal medicine. And then after that, I did three years of dermatology. And then I started my dermatology practice. And actually probably back in 2004, in addition to practicing in dermatology, I started to learn about um, lifestyle medicine and what the scientific evidence behind lifestyle medicine is. Now, along with this, and I'll get to the point that I'm about to make, is that sunblock, there are several sunscreens out there that have for years been known to be potentially toxic. And actually in laboratory was shown to be toxic. Um, then it was shown to be toxic to, to coral reefs, but also um, shown to essentially be, be toxic, some of them. And um, I was in a dermatology forum and, and someone was commenting on that. And I made a few comments uh, about how the science has been done for many, many years now. It's just that the, the national, you know, the American Academy of Dermatology was essentially very slow to, to discussing it, in fact. And this really points to several different things and it comes, it's an important thing to understand. First of all, when it comes to dermatology or any subspecialty in medicine, there is a well-defined literature. There are specific journals and unfortunately there's so much volume, new volume of medical information that comes out. What happens is, is that specialists can become very, very focused on the medical literature in their field, much to the exclusion of what's happening outside the field. One of the most glaring problems that I see is that there is an entire nutritional literature. And although there could be a, let's take dermatology as an example, there could be several articles written about nutrition and psoriasis but that is in the nutritional literature. It doesn't necessarily get into the dermatology literature. And when it gets into the dermatology literature, there is not the same nuance at looking at that literature unless you are sort of involved and, and consistently in it. And the same thing goes with toxicology. Toxicology has a very, very well-defined body of medical literature to it. And what will happen is, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, dementia later on tonight and it, the role of toxins in that. And, and but what, what happens is there'll be a slight foray from toxins into say the Alzheimer's neurology literature. Um, but there is next to that in the toxicology literature, an entire well-developed um, well-developed core of incredible knowledge that's built up that often takes, you know, 15, 20 years to filter into the specialty. So getting back to my story, as I was commenting on, on a dermatology forum where it was just a board certified dermatologist like myself, I was attacked like you wouldn't believe for just mentioning the, the toxicology of literature uh, it was really remarkable and it really drove home a lesson here to myself that is that when you get into discussing all these other things, you have, you have to have somewhat of a sense of um, understanding that there is an entire world of science 
that is being done in these very narrow fields that often takes time to filter in. So when you're, when you're seeing nutritional literature, there's often very high profile people that come on the news and they say, you know, vitamins are useless and all this sort of stuff. A lot of those people are one, they're, they're focused on population wide statistics and not looking at personalized medicine. And two, they're just not familiar with the actual nutritional literature on specific vitamins, et cetera. They are just focused on, on their particular field and you can be very, very narrow-minded and there's so much, so much information just to keep up with that you might not be up on the literature that's happening in, in say the nutritional field. So I wanted to explain that in the context of what we're speaking about today, because a lot of practitioners, MDs, are just not really familiar with the toxicology literature. It's so deep, it's, it's deep and profound. They're centers of toxicology. Where I went to medical school in, um, at Rutgers University in New Jersey, there was a beautiful, beautiful, huge uh, department of toxicology. It was like a five-story, beautiful building. And the entire building was devoted to toxicology, understanding, um, tox uh, understanding toxins, toxicants, toxics. And um, so with that in mind, let's start talking about um, understanding environmental toxins. So it really starts with the liver. Now we have lots of ways of getting rid of toxins. We can get rid of them through, um, through feces, through urine, through sweat. Um, through breast milk is another way that, that sometimes women actually detoxify. Um, we'll get into all that, but let's go through actually what's going on in the liver so you can have an understanding of it. Now don't get too, too um, scared with this particular chart. This is from the Institute for Functional Medicine. And the Institute for Functional Medicine is a really remarkable organization. It's really, I've learned an enormous amount from them. I'm taking a multi-month course with them right now. And most of this lecture actually comes from various learning resources from Institute for Functional Medicine. And this is one of the diagrams that really summarizes what's going on with the liver. And we'll really just superficially go through this um, because um, I wanna get through everything. <laughs> so it starts here. Um, Unfortunately, it looks like, a, let me see if I, no, it's highlighting the entire field. So it starts here on the left with these lipid soluble, so fat soluble toxins. And in this case, they're talking about the toxins that are stored in your fat. And we've spoken about this actually before when it comes to looking at really assessing your meat intake, because if you're not getting clean meat and you're eating fat from, you know, just conventionally grown meat, you're going to be actually eating an enormous amount of toxins because the animal stores a lot of their fat soluble toxins in the fat. And as you're gaining weight, um, as you're, if you're becoming obese, the more fat that you have, the more you're sort of sequestering and, and taking and holding onto toxins. And when people go through weight loss, rapid weight loss, they can get very, very sick. And the reason is, is as an example, is that these toxins are then rushed into the liver and rushed into the bloodstream so quickly that people can get very, very sick. Anyone who has had people go through weight loss programs, if they go through them quickly, they're not eating a lot of fiber, which, can, um, which I'll explain in a moment why that's important, then they can be releasing an enormous amount of toxins. Now, when the toxins get released, you would like them to go to the liver and eventually be sent out through the bile um, into, the, into the feces and stool um, or into the kidneys and urine. But let's take the, the feces and the stool. What happens is if you're not having fiber and eating an enormous amount, a good amount of fiber, is that what happens is, is the toxins go through the liver. Hopefully there's no issues with, with, other, uh, with the liver itself and its ability to de detoxify. And so it gets released from the fat, goes into the, the bloodstream, goes into the liver, gets then sent into the intestinal tract to, to go out through your feces. Now, if, what, if there is no fiber in there, what happens is your body just reabsorbs it into your body and you get this recirculation of toxins. 
and that can make people enormously sick when they, when they lose weight. That's why when people are going through weight loss programs, they often have an increase in one, toxic metabolites, these, these things that are responsible for inflammation. Um, here you get reactive oxygen intermediates, which are basically like you know oxidants essentially. And you get, you get tissue damage and you can uh, get increased aging as a result of this sort of thing. So what's the, so what's the deal? The deal is that if you're gonna lose weight, you wanna make sure that you are eating enough fiber so that some of these toxins can actually be taken out of the system and not go through this recirculation. And that's very, very important because you don't wanna be sick. And there's also you know, potentially some risk factors that, that come with, with rapid weight, weight loss. Like for example, high triglycerides and as I said, inflammatory markers that are they're not very good for you. Um, so you wanna do slow, consistent weight loss with lots of fiber. Now we have a program, of course, that is the fasting mimicking diet, which I've spoken about many times, which is a five day um, fasting with food program where people are able to eat food, but at a reduced calorie count, but that has an enormous amount of fiber in it. So people lose five, 10, five or 10 pounds there, um, but they're not really getting a lot of the toxic reactions because of the fiber that you're eating with that particular program. So what's going on here is that the, these fat soluble toxins are released into the bloodstream and they go through two phases, this phase one and phase two. And they're all kinds, it's like an organic chemistry lab. You know, you get, there's oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, hydration, dehalogenation. And during each one of these processes, there's various, various nutrients that are used to make the process proceed well, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B6, folic acid, B12, glutathione, which is sort of the master antioxidant in the body, branch chain amino acids, flavonoids, phospholipids. So you're seeing here that not necessarily do you need to be taking these vitamins, but you need to be having a well-rounded diet, of course, with lots of fruits and vegetables, pigmented things to get those flavonoids, um, adequate amount of, of protein. And all of these things are going to allow the toxins to get from this first stage to the next stage where, where it's conjugated. Conjugated means that it's attached, essentially it's attached to something that makes it able to be excreted. And that's where these processes that you don't need to know them, but um, sulfation, gl glucuronidation, all these sorts of methylation, which we've spoken about in, in other, other classes, and all of these, this also has nutrients, different, different nutrients, glycine, taurine, glutamine, these uh, are um, um, an N-acetylcysteine, which we use in emergency rooms when people come in with uh, Tylenol toxicity, um, methionine, which is an amino acid. Um, and so all of these things are needed to get from this phase to this phase. And in some patients, what happens, unfortunately, is they have a problem in phase two, and all this can, can roughly be measured. There's lots of new, amazing labs that are coming out, but some people have a problem where they can't get from phase one to phase two, and that can be very, very toxic. So what can happen is you can speed up the process by using these nutrients, but if you haven't taken care of what's going on over here, you can be left with these intermediate metabolites, which are very toxic. So you can end up increasing the toxicity by just you know, going crazy on phase, on phase one. Um, so anyway, as it goes through, it then gets um, conjugated, attached essentially to something to make it water soluble, and then it's excreted. And that's basically um, how, how the system works. So in the beginning, you have toxicity that's running around making you sick, and in the middle, you have toxicity that's happening. And both of these cause an enormous amount of damage unless the, this phase one and phase two are doing what they're supposed to do. Now, many of you may have heard of what's called the cytochrome P450 a family of enzymes because a lot of medications that people take are, can affect the cytochrome P450 system. And if you look at the, the insert of a lot of medications, you'll see that they actually can inhibit the P450 system. 
um, which is of course going to affect your overall detoxification. So, um, so that's basically what's going on in the liver. I hope uh, I hope that was interesting and not too not too complicated. And I can't believe we're already twenty minutes in. All right. So uh, so essentially, there are really two approaches. You can either avoid toxins, and I spent a lot of time in the lecture, like the fourth or sixth week. You can see it on my YouTube channel. Um, or you can choose foods that improve the detoxification process. And those would be foods that, that we sort of spoke about. Um, of course, cruciferous vegetables are, are very good um, because they have a lot of, of these things in there. Um, and actually a little soy can also, also has also been shown to be, to be helpful, believe it or not. That's sort of uh, something that soy has gotten sort of a bad name for a lot of people. And not that I'm recommending that people overindulge in in uh, soy, but it has been shown to be relatively beneficial, uh, most of the studies in small amounts for, for, for women's health, um, but not in excess. I mean, the Japanese don't eat an enormous amount of soy, but if they do, they, they're usually, it's usually fermented soy and even the amount of tofu, let's say that they eat, it's really not a huge amount. Um, it's, it, no one's eating huge amounts of tofu or processed soy protein or anything like that. You want to mimic what traditional cultures have, have done. The Japanese ferment their miso, which is soy. They ferment their, their beans, which is natto. Um, the, the tofu, of course, they're, they're not using in huge amounts. So that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's close this down and go to plastics and female sex hormones. And it really comes down to what are called EDCs or endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I want to stress one more time that just because I'm, this is all so overwhelming when you see the enormous impacts that these chemicals can potentially have that it will make you feel almost defeated. That's not my purpose here. My purpose is to obviously educate you and also to remind you that not everyone is going to be affected by these things, but it's good to know, I mean, it's always good to know. And there are those of you out there that could potentially be affected by these. Again, it's not everyone who, who, who is having these problems. So it can really be broken down into, um, we have chemicals that, are, that have been pretty consistently determined now to cause early puberty. A dichlorobenzene is one of them, it's a, it's a fumigant and the NHANES data, which is sort of the standard, which stands for um, National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, Nutrition uh, Examination Survey data, and has been going on for many, many years and is really the number one source of information for so many different things. Um, but that has actually been associated with the earlier onset of puberty, and we're, we're certainly seeing that. And remarkably, uh, some, I actually heard um, something this morning, I haven't confirmed it, that they basically are just saying they're actually gonna move the, you know, the healthy puberty to a lower age, just because that's what's happening without sort of any thought about, well, maybe it's happening, you know, for, for a reason. Uh, I know there was a problem, I believe it was in Puerto Rico many years ago where there was some sort of um, hormone in the milk that was causing uh, early puberty. Um, so there've been many, many toxins that, several toxins that have shown that. There are also 15 toxins that have been associated with early menopause in the same data set, in the same, in another study using the data from NHANES study. There have been pregnancy length disorders. Um, and so how do we group these things? So they can basically be grouped into industrial, agricultural, residential, and pharmaceuticals. And industrials are things like dioxin and PCBs, which we spoke a lot about in the first lecture. Um, agricultural pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, residential um, bisphenol A, um, phthal phthalates, which are found in plastics, um, and bisphenol A, BPA, a lot of you have probably heard of that because a lot of packages say BPA free. There's been some association with a polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, and the, it's sort of an estrogen mimic. And it's when it says BPA, unfortunately, 
that really doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have uh, something in it. It could be bisphenol S or bisphenol F. So you can have a bisphenol, a BPA free that has one of these things in it. I, I don't know how any, I, I mean, that's just insane to me um, that, that's, that that's the case. Um, so bisphenol A um, is like the lining of cans, um, receipts when you go to the store, uh, which are fairly significant risk, or I should say exposure risk. So when you get, again, you can get into the weeds here where it makes you look like you're some crazy person because you're trying to avoid you know, everything. Look, we can't avoid everything. We have to be honest. We live in a modern world and we just can't avoid anything. And the, the how, how far you go, it's sort of up to you. But I will tell you that I don't touch, when I go to say Whole Foods and they, you know, they hand me the receipt, I just have them drop in the bag. Now that may appear like I'm going, that I've gone off the deep end and I'm just some crazy health nut. But, you know, when you end up looking at the studies and the, the effect of actually just taking it and sort of crunching it in your hand, you get an enormous amount of exposure. Now, would that do anything to me? Hmm, I don't know, probably not. I mean, maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't, but I know enough about it that I don't want to have the exposure. I don't want to have an estrogen mimic in my body uh, in any way, so I avoid it. Could it be that my liver would be perfectly capable of getting rid of it? Yeah, it's possible, um, but I don't want to chance it. So. Um, in my last lecture, I went through all the plastics, how to, how to determine which plastics um, to avoid, but just be aware of plastics. I mean, if you're, if you're using Tupperware that's been gone through the, the uh, you know, dishwasher and the heat you know, a dozen times, I mean, you know, you're probably better off switching to the glass Tupperware type of, of things. It's just, it's gonna be safer and you're not gonna get leak, leakage of, of that. Uh, also, of course, um, cooking instruments, nonstick pans have, have, have issues with them as well. Again, I don't want to, it's sort of this, this lecture is sort of like a beast because it's like, you know, it's like you're getting attacked from every angle. And again, I'll just repeat it again that, you know, you're, you may be doing everything right in such a way that your liver is perfectly capable of handling all of these things. Um, so it's just important to know because there's some people who, who might not be able to handle handle it all. So how do you get exposed? Um, well, obviously um, inhalation, food intake and direct contact. And here's where I would like to make a quick note um, about personal care products. Now, the same thing goes, um, when I was in that dermatology forum with other dermatologists, I also mentioned the fact that there are numerous uh, studies to show that there are enormous amount of toxins in in personal care products. The average woman, you, you know, generally uses, you know, it's like when you look at the questionnaires, it's like, you know, 15 to 20 um, products, you know, on a, on a regular basis. And generally dermatologists only focus on, is there a contact dermatology, contact dermatitis type of reaction. But I think it's our responsibility to inform our patients that there are a lot of personal care products that we're putting onto the skin that are absorbed into the body <clears throat> and have potential endocrine disrupting, there are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, again, I, I hate to keep repeating it because, because I keep repeating it, but maybe it's not gonna have any impact on you, but it, in some people it will. There's an organization called the uh, Environmental Working Group. If you go there, you can enter the products that you have that you're putting on your skin and see what kind of things are in there. And, you know, there's a whole movement now of creating products that don't have all of these terrible chemicals in them. And you can find those on EWG. You can look and see what your products, what products have in there. I mean, things like triclosan, which was, you know, was an antibacterial that was put in just about everything. And I remember recommending it early on in my practice, you know, because it, it, it was, known to be a really, quote, safe uh, antibacterial that didn't cause any kind of um, bacterial resistance. And sure enough, it turned out to have some, some toxic effects and it's 
essentially being removed from from everything. So it's so you so the EWG is a very very good resource for you to go to and just put in your products and and see you know see what's in there and and see what kind of alternatives that you might have. All right, I hope I'm not scaring everyone. Um, okay, so we went through that already. All right, so we've spoken about endocrine disrupting chemicals. Uh, most of the time, they are estrogen mimetics. They are they mimic estrogen in the body, and we don't want that. Obviously, for a man, we don't want that. If we're a woman, we don't want that either. We want to have the right amount and the right balance of hormones because the hormonal system is remarkably complicated. I'm taking, as I said, a multi-month course uh, with the Institute for Functional Medicine, and the the hormone section is just uh, it's just it's mind-boggling how complicated the hormonal system is. And that's why I'm, ha I'm happy there are very good endocrinolo endocrinologists out there. All right, so let's go to, um, I wanna end this class in the next 15 minutes, sorry. Uh, we still have a fair amount to go through. So let's talk about POPs or what are called persistent organic pollutants. And um, these are found in water and wind and they're impossible to avoid. Um, and they've been associated with metabolic syndrome. Now that doesn't mean that they are the cause of metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome being that situation where there's obesity and insulin resistance and, and high triglycerides and high cholesterol. Um, and it, that is, uh, I'm not saying that's a cause. And as I spoke about in the very beginning, one of the takeaways from the last toxic toxin lecture way back um, many, many, um, couple months ago was that it was a contributing factor to obesity, meaning the obesity, the, the say side effects of obesity that are possible were made worse when toxins were on board. That's probably the best way to describe it. So 2018 study showed morbidly obese patients uh, associated with, uh, related to PCBs and pesticides um, also may impair the functioning of normal weight people. So even though the side effects to were happening, the side effects of weight loss, let's say, were amplified by, by the toxins, you also may be getting some impairment in met metabolic function, where we're talking about, again, insulin resistance and high cholesterol with people who are just normal weight. And no one knows exactly why, but one study showed that there was actually a change in, in the ratio of good to bad um, bacteria in the gut, as well as glucose alterations. So no one's exactly sure what, why, but one study showed, showed that and, and glucose. They're probably gonna find out more as, as time goes by. And we spoke about this a little bit more. Uh, when you get, when you're losing weight you know, too fast and you're not eating enough fiber, um, you can get very, very fat. I'm sorry, you can get very sick. And they're because they're fat soluble. So you're releasing the toxins into, into the bloodstream. And this midlife obesity can increase dementia risk because you're getting a slow release when you have when you're building up fat over time. There, there, there's always going to be a slow release of these toxins. And the more fat that you have, the more that's going to happen. And that has essentially been associated with an increase in, in dementia risk. So how do we get toxins out of the system? Well, we already know about the liver, but I wanted to discuss a little bit about how important sleep is in, in getting rid of toxins in the brain. And there's something called the glymphatic system. Uh, we know about the lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is, um, you know, we have arteries, we have veins, and then, you know, when when it, the blood goes through the arteries and then it goes through, you know, gets filters down into capillaries and then back into veins and then it runs back into the, the heart. And in that process, you're getting fluid in the interstitial, in the spaces around these things, especially as it's going through like the capillaries and you get lymph formed and lymph um, is then drained. And um, this is a part of the process of of how your 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 uh, 
fluid in your body sort of moves around. Now, in the um, brain, there is something called the glymphatic system. Uh, G stands for glia, glial cells. Glial cells are basically, uh, they support the neurons and they live in a, what's called a paravascular space outside the, ve the vessels of the brain. And there's a lot we don't know about the glymphatic system, but essentially what we do know is that, that the cerebrospinal fluid, which is sort of what your brain and your, and your spinal cord are, are like floating in, um, C C C cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, is moved through this, this space where the glial, glial cells are. And at night, the space, the outside of the vessels, this is what they call a paravascular space, expands and proteins and waste are then transported out. So as I said, it, they know, they, they're still sort of learning about this. It's controversial, um, but we do know that these spaces where the glial cells are do play, at least definitively, do play some role in toxin removal because toxins go from the CSF into the interstitial fluid. And one thing we know is that there's something called beta amyloid, which accumulates during sleep deprivation. Now, many of you may have heard of beta amyloid because it's associated with Alzheimer's disease. And when you have uh, a lot of beta amyloid, uh, when you, what happens is with, with Alzheimer's, you end up getting this amyloid, these amyloid deposits, which is a sign that there is damage going on essentially. And just with, with sleep deprivation, you're getting beta amyloid acc accumulation. Um, so the paravascular system that we spoke about where these glial cells are, may also be impaired in metabolic syndrome. So uh, could it be related to the fact that there is such a thing as diabetes induced dementia? So we're getting a little, maybe too detailed here. Um, also, there's nasal lymphatic vessels and meningeal lymphatic vessels that also drain the brain. But what happens is, is that um, if you have an overall decrease, there has been overall an overall decrease in sleep duration across the population. And it has been correlated with toxin exposures. That doesn't mean it's the actual cause, but there is an association. And better reported sleep has also been reported with improved health outcomes and your blood sugar can essentially be damaged, can be irregular for 45 hours after just one, 48 hours after just one poor night of sleep. So it's very important that I did an entire, or at least most of a lecture on sleep, uh, go back a couple of weeks uh, to discuss, to go over that. So now let's talk about how to prepare your food. Well, we spoke about avoiding the right, eating the right food in a sense, but we haven't really spoken about what, could there be something that we do in terms of food preparation that could be making it better or making it worse? <clears throat> so as I said, we focus on, on the what about food, what, what foods, but how food is cooked is also important. And when it comes right down to it, it comes down to two things, grilled foods and what are called the exogenous AGEs. And that will sort of round out uh, tonight's lecture. Now with grilled foods, we're essentially talking about grilled, grilled and fried meat. Now what's the deal with grilled and fried meat? Well, anytime you are grilling and frying, you actually do get what are called heterocyclic amines and a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Both of these are carcinogens. Um, now, these are formed essentially when you're really burning and heating the, the meat. Um, that's why braising and boiling, lower temperature, non-burning kinds of cooking with meat is always going to be less dangerous. And the reason is, is the, the PAHs, these uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, are essentially formed when fat drips on the grill. And then there's this like, you know, fumes, flame, uh, that that then coats the food with, with these chemicals. And the fumes, and there actually have been studies to show that just the fumes get absorbed through your skin, of course, breathing as well, but also through your skin. Um, now, the, the question is raised, which I've already raised a lot already before, which is how great is the risk? 
And getting to the bottom of that actually has been very, very difficult. We do know that these are in the lab carcinogens. It's very difficult to, to do a study to be able to determine what the actual risk is. And in line with what I've been talking about the entire night, which is, you know, maybe it's not gonna affect you in any way at all, who knows? Um, we can't, I can't give you, the studies are not definitively enough to be able to give you, uh, you know, you have a 30% increased risk of, you know, colon cancer if you do this, eat this or that. But we do know there are carcinogens. And eventually I think, you know, in some sort of setting, you, they'll be able to determine what that is. It would be very difficult to do a study, you know, on that. So you would have to, you know, a definitive study is you would have to have people, you know, start eating grilled barbecued meat, which probably you could recruit many people to do that. And, you know, then another group that, you know, that doesn't, but it, that, that would be a very, very difficult study to, to perform. But what can you do? Well, believe it or not, antioxidant marinades that have garlic, ginger, thyme, rosemary, and I came across one study where they actually marinated the, the uh, meat in, in dark beer for several hours. And that actually reduced the amount of carcinogens that actually get formed when you grill the meat. So if you're gonna grill meat and you wanna have a really potent um, antioxidant marinade that it sits in because then that can prevent that from happening. Uh, try your best to avoid charring. And of course, the leaner, the better, because you're not going to get the drippings that are then going to, to flame up and coat the meat with, uh, with toxins. Uh, again, I know this, this, this is like you can't win type of lecture. Um, and I'm sorry to, to do that to you. But again, I, as I've said many times, you know, it may not be all that significant to you, but then again, it might be. So it's good to have that information. We've spoken about advanced glycation end products before. It's when sugar and protein bind. When it happens internally, uh, you get like the side effects of diabetes, you know, like um, kidney damage and retinal damage. That's what's happened. You get skin wrinkling. Um, and we've spoken about that many times, many times before. But there's also something called, so that's what are called endogenous, so internal. AGEs. Then there's something called ex exogenous, so coming from the outside. So when you grill and overcook um, red meat, uh, just generally red meat and cheese have these sugars bound to, to protein. And when you eat them, you get a, a little bit of a different effect, but you still have um, effects, negative effects on wound healing, insulin resistance, cardiovascular diseases, all these things by eating them. Now, uh, red meat and cheese are high in, a, in, in these AGEs. So obviously we should be careful with, I mean, no, no one should be eating a lot, a lot and a lot of red meat and cheese. We already know that, but it's good to know, give you another reason to, to think about sort of reducing that. Other proteins have it like chicken, fish, and eggs, but much less than red meat and cheese. Grains that are crispy and brown. So any sort of browned crackers, are very, very high in exogenous AGEs. Uh, one thing, uh, rice cakes are super high. I mean, everyone thinks rice cakes are, are lot, some people think rice cakes are a very, very healthy snack. They're not a healthy snack whatsoever um, because one, they make your blood sugar go up, but two, they're also, they also have these exogenous AGEs. Uh, fatty cookies with sugar. Um, vegetable fats are, have less than animal fats but you have to be careful with vegetable fats that we've spoken about before that you're not doing like seed oils, like corn, sunflower, safflower, because those are very unstable and they oxidize, which is another problem. Um, but if you're sticking with traditional vegetable fats like uh, olive oil or coconut oil or um, sesame oil, those that have a tradition of use, then the risk is gonna be less. So, when it comes to cooking your food safely, uh, you wanna make sure you, you wanna learn essentially to have some new techniques, learn braising, use an instant pot because that's going to uh, be cooked in water. Um, braising, uh, slow cooker, instant pot, that sort of thing. And then be conscious of the foods like red meat, cheese, and toasted snacks. Uh, that's, that's something that you really should be careful of. And then 
to top it all off is cookware and dishes, <laughs> which, you know, as we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we spoke about the fact that some of these non-stick pans really have, have, you really have to be careful of. So that is tonight's lecture. Um, I know it's like a crazy one in the sense that it just feels like an onslaught of stuff, but we basically briefly reviewed really what the liver does. I hope that was interesting to, to you to see sort of how that, how that actually works. And then we spoke about these endocrine disrupting hormones. I, I totally recommend that everyone go to EWG and, and put in their EWG.org and put in their, uh, their, their products. We spoke about the persi persistent organic pollutants, sleep and how important that is to remove the toxins from the brain and how to prepare food safely. Next week, we'll be discussing mental health and lifestyle and how we can impact just our overall sense of happiness and how, believe it or not, lifestyle has an enormous, lifestyle and nutrition has an enormous role in that. And the, the medical literature is really showing some remarkable, remarkable things. And, you know, the fact is that a lot of the things that we've been speaking about these past weeks are going to recur in terms of certain foods that should be included, certain vegetables that should be included in your diet and certain, certain fatty acids. And to me, that's the greatest thing that even though we're talking about different subjects, we start to reinforce certain ideas and you see them repeating over and over again in different parts of the body. And to me, that's really exciting because it allows you to understand the concepts better by hearing them again and again, but with like more fortified information and more of an appreciation of how really powerful nutrition and lifestyle can be. So thank you so much for your attention today. I uh, really do appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing you um, next week, every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. And um, like I said, um, wish everyone a great night and, and great, great health. So see you next Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Bye, everybody.